I grew up with that song. As many of you uh, probably have heard it for years and years too. Detroit First Church, back when I was a teenager where I attended, um, was a large church at that time. We went on live broadcast radio on Sunday nights at 7.15. Now you may think that sounds like an odd time. Church started at 7 o'clock. And uh, they had the announcements and the offering and all that stuff before 7.15 so that when we went live on the air, it wouldn't sound like all we were doing was begging for money. Churches don't do that. Well, we do, but we don't. Anyhow, uh, at 7.14, just like clockwork, every Sunday night, the song director would get up. They were called song directors then, not worship leaders. The song director would get up, and he would say, turn to page, I think it was 199 in the own hymnal, called on to holiness. And we would sing, called on to holiness, church of our God. And I can still hear that large congregation of seven or 800 people just reverberating through that sanctuary, called on to holiness, church of our God. And it just reverberated in verse after verse. And, and as we went online, or online, on, on live broadcast every Sunday night at 7.15, there was that song reverberating through the sanctuary, called on to holiness, church of our God. Purchase of Jesus redeemed by the blood. And I, I, the reason I know it sounded good on the radio is because there was occasional time that mom and dad had been sick. We had to stay home on Sunday nights. And um, I think dad had had a heart attack on that period. And so there were some Sunday nights we were home. And, and it was awesome to be able to hear that just coming over the radio speakers, called on to holiness. That is the theme song of the Church of the Nazarene. And uh, it may well have been written at pilot point in time for that purpose. We use the word holiness and holy quite freely. Holy Bible. Holy communion. Holy Spirit. We sing holy, holy, holy. We sing other songs that have the name holy in them. The Church of the Nazarene, along with Free Methodists, Wesleyans, and several other denominations are holiness churches. The word holy comes from the medieval English and is the root of such words as health and whole and wholeness. We tend to look at the outward signs of holiness or sanctification and we smother them in religious baggage and language. Today's message is on the spirit of holiness. If you look at uh, Romans chapter 1, the first four verses, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son who as to his human nature was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was declared to, by, with power to be the son of God through the spirit of holiness. We talk about the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit comes in and fills us. The Holy Spirit comes and gives us power. But during this sermon of series, this sermon of series, this series of sermons, we're going to find a lot of things about God's Spirit. God's Spirit is the Spirit of holiness. The uh, fact about Jesus being given power is a whole nother sermon in itself. We're not going to get into that today. It's the spirit of holiness that gave him the power. The spirit of holiness. I think of the spirit of holiness. I think of the holiness of God, and all I can use as the word is awesome. If uh, we look back in the Old Testament times, if we look back into the book of Revelations, we find the Holy of Holies there mentioned in the Old Testament. It was a place where nobody could go into. It was a place where if the priest wanted to go into the Holy of Holies, 
He had certain requirements that he had to do and, and all kinds of stuff and, and special clothes he had to wear. And he had to make sure that in his mind and in his heart, he was perfectly holy. And when that priest would go into the Holy of Holies, they would tie a rope around his leg. And so he would go into the Holy of Holies and he would part that curtain and go behind that curtain. And, and, and if I guess if they heard a loud scream or something, and a cathod, they knew he had dropped dead. Because you could not go in the presence of God unless you were perfectly holy yourself. And so the rope was there for the simple purpose. If the guy dropped dead back there, they had to get him out somehow. And so they drug him out with the rope. Sounds kind of gruesome. But it just points to the fact that nobody can stand to minister in the place of God. God alone is holy. He is the spirit of holiness. And the angels could only cry, holy, holy is the Lord. If you look to Revelation chapter 4, uh, um, around uh, verses 1 through 10, you find a description of the throne room. It talks about the candles. It talks about, about the, uh, uh, the spirit. It talks about the angels standing around. It talks about all different kinds of people there and figures. And all they're doing is crying, holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty. I, I find it interesting in, in uh, verse um, 10 of Revelation chapter 4. It talks about the 24 elders who fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and ever. There's a simple fact about God's holiness. He is so far above all that is human and mundane that it's indescribable. We cannot imagine God's holiness. We talk about holy people. I've heard it mentioned all down through the years, so-and-so is so holy. And we have this concept in our mind that this person in their lifestyle is full of an integrity. In everything they say and do, they just ooze God's love. When we talk about somebody being so holy, we talk about somebody who we can't even imagine doing anything spiritually wrong. They're saintly. They're godly. And so we say they're holy. We talk about holy men of God. I had someone not too long ago tell me that they thought I was holy. Boy, I didn't tell them all my faults. I, I enjoyed that second. Just from a human standpoint, I enjoyed that second. We talk about holy men of God, and, and it is somebody who is full of integrity. Somebody who we look at as a great spiritual leader. We talk about other things as being holy. And yet our definition of holy is so small compared to what and who God is that we can't even imagine his holiness. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, No eye has seen or ear has heard what God has prepared for those who love him, but it is now revealed by the Holy Spirit. We can't fathom God. The spirit of holiness, the way I look at it, is God's spirit letting us know how we are to live. God's spirit coming down, entering into our lives, and just reminding us of how we're to live day after day after day. In our humanness, we fall so short of that. In our humanness, I wonder how often we let God down. The other night, uh, Jennifer needed to borrow something from me, and uh, I uh, came up here and picked it up. I was at the church. I took it by the house, and she was taking a nap. And uh, Brooke got her mother's car keys for me. She knew right where they were. I thought it was kind of awesome, a nine-year-old knowing, was she eight or nine now? Eight, okay, an eight-year-old. Can't even remember how old my grand. I have to ask the other grandmother how old the grand, grandkid is. She got keys and said, and this is the button you push to open the back door in the car, Grandpa. So uh, I went out and transferred the stuff from my car into Jennifer's car, and I told Brooke, now I want you to do two things for me. 
I want you to tell your dad when he gets home from work to please call me. And the second thing is, I want you to tell your mother that what she asked for is in the back of her car. Well, Kurt called me about 10 after 7 on his way home from work. And so I thought, well, Brooke did a good job of that. He hadn't even been home yet. But um, Saturday morning, about 8.45, I get a text message from Jennifer. Are you bringing that keyboard to me, or am I picking it up? I was so disappointed in Brooke. She had fallen so short of what I asked her to do. Oh, I'm just kidding. You know that. I just sent her a quick message back. It's already in your car. Oh, okay. I wonder how many times God looks at us with a reminder of something and we forget. We fall short. Because he is way up here in his holiness and we're down here in our human understanding. And so we need that spirit of holiness of God to constantly remind us day after day after day how we are to live who we are in him. Over in Exodus 19, verse 6, we find that God called Israel to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. He called them, and he gave them a way of, of obtaining their righteousness before God. If you look through the book of Leviticus, you find all these ceremonies and laws that people had to follow. You find things about the dedication of the firstborn and the distinction between clean and unclean food. You weren't supposed to eat pork back in those days because it was dirty. Well, pork is still dirty, but for some reason we eat it now. I guess they can clean the meat. You find provision for purifications, laws against disfigurement. That's where this thing about Christians shouldn't get tattoos came from. Laws against unnatural marriages. Holiness of priests and places and festivals. They were laws and customs that were merely outward acts. What I want to say is this. True holiness does not come from a show. True holiness does not come from all of the outward acts. True holiness comes from God within us and is expressed in the way we act on the outside. I cannot force my holiness on myself. Oh, I can get cleaned up and look nice. I can act nice. I can talk nice. But if I don't have it in my life, somewhere, somehow, the rottenness is going to come out. Holiness is from God. It's one of his chief attributes. Exodus 15, 11, Who was like you, majestic in holiness? 1 Samuel 2, 2, There is no one holy like the Lord. Revelations 15, 4, You, O Lord, alone are holy. Holiness is entire freedom from moral evil and absolute moral perfection. Think about that. Holiness is freedom from moral evil. It's moral perfection. It's the desire to live as God lives. Now, God is not subject to some law or standard of moral excellence. He wrote the book on it. I was looking through my library the other day. I've got several books. One's entitled The Image of Righteousness. It talks about God's image in our lives. I found another one, the 51% principle. Um, the business uh, back here, the, the truck company, the, 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 car, the car wash, the truck wash. They own this lot over here with all these wonderful trucks that are parked here that block the view of our building coming from the west. Uh, down through the years, uh, They've come over here and wanted to purchase property from us. They wanted to expand. They've offered to buy the back third of our back lot. They've offered to buy the back two thirds. They've offered to buy almost up to our parking lot. They've offered trades at different times. For one time, they came and they wanted to trade the back third of our property for this lot over here. I thought, well, that sounded pretty good. And before I went to the church board with that thought, I, I sat down and I talked to the owner 
very seriously about it, thinking, boy, wouldn't that be great to have all this road frontage here and not have anything blocking the view from down there as people came this way? And it looked like it was going to get down to a deal where maybe I could go to the church board and say, what do you think about getting rid of the back third of that field? And by the way, if you've ever cut the grass out there, you know that'd be a good idea because when your wife keeps taking that lawnmower back and forth this way, it's, it's a mess. It, 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 it jars your gizzard. Anyhow, it came down to it, and the brother came to me, and he said, or the owner came to me, and he said, uh, deal's off. I said, why? He said, I own 49% of the company. My brother owns 51%. He doesn't want to do it. I've thought about that down through the years in relation to that book I have, The 51% Principle. God owns more of me than I do. He's in control. And when his spirit of holiness falls on me, that becomes a controlling factor in my life. The 51% principle. I have another book entitled Christian Excellence. You see, these are all books that talk about the outward signs of what God does internally in us. They all refer to our standing in Christ, a better life, how to live a holy life, how to be spiritual. They all point to God as the giver of life, the giver of perfection, the giver of holiness. All moral law and perfection have their eternal and unchangeable basis in God's own nature. He is the standard of excellence. He is the 51% principle. He is the image of righteousness. Jesus Christ was holiness in the flesh. 1 Peter 1.19, Christ was a lamb without blemish or defect. John 8, 46, can any of you prove Jesus guilty of sin? Hebrews 4, 15, he was tempted in every way just as we are. What happens when we're tempted? We fight it. We claw our way out. Sometimes we cave in. He was tempted, yet without sin. His holiness was from his divine nature, yet also from his lifestyle while on earth. He was a moral miracle. He depended on God. He had poverty, he had persecution, he had hatred, he had loneliness, he had death, and yet he was free from sin because he was the spirit of holiness. He had power through the spirit of holiness. He is the perfect example and the one who brought power to this earth for us to see. 1 Peter 2.21 says, Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. I look at all this and I think, what does that have to say to me today? Practical holiness for today. How do I live out my life with Jesus Christ, with the spirit of holiness in me, in a world that is so full of rottenness and sin and problem after problem after problem? We talk about ceremonial holiness, the acts and the traditions that we hold on to. I had a lady some years ago that, uh, when we were managing a camp, uh, called me and she said, I lost my Bible at camp meeting. And I haven't been able to pray or have my devotion since because that was my favorite Bible. Do you think you can find it for me? So here we are in the middle of kids camps. Camp meeting have just ended. And those ladies want me to find her favorite Bible. Believe it or not, we found it in a back corner of the tabernacle that had been cleared out so we could play recreation in there on rainy days. It was a big multi-purpose building. And I've thought about how we get tied into things. And without those things, we have trouble worshiping God. 
ceremonial holiness. Traditions we get hung on to. Acts that we do, if we don't do them, we don't feel holy. Do we have to have a certain form of worship every week? As a kid growing up, it just felt like if we didn't sing called on to holiness on Sunday night, something was wrong. Because it became a habit. We didn't need to sing called on to holiness to be holy. We needed to live the life that we were called on to in order to be holy. We needed to allow God into our life in order to be holy. You see, our holiness is in our character and our conduct. I sometimes think that we allow holiness to be the fact that we don't wear earrings or some people nose rings. I sometimes think that we allow holiness to be the clothes that we wear. If I don't wear a suit on Sunday morning, am I any less holy than on a Sunday where I do wear a suit? In fact, I had someone a few weeks ago say, Pastor, we're not a fancy church. Why don't you just forget a tie totally? So I did for the summer. And then Kurt said my microphone didn't hang right if I didn't have a tie on, so it's his fault that I'm wearing a tie now. We tie holiness into the way we dress. And yes, we're to be dressed modestly. We tie holiness into all kinds of things that may have nothing to do with holiness. They're outward signs that we can fake. The spirit of holiness gets inside of us and it stops being ceremonial. It stops being a tradition. It starts being a lifestyle that comes from God in us and we just go in automatic. We're automatically living for God. And as long as we keep our part of the bargain, keeping God's word and we keep praying and we keep trusting and we keep allowing him into our lives day after day after day, he just keeps filling us with his power to walk for him every day. I don't know about you, but I find myself, the closer I get to God, the easier it is to live his ways. And it becomes that type of thing that when we get off the path just a little bit, he puts us right back in the place because something in our head clicks and we just know we're doing wrong and we've got to get back to the right place. The spirit of holiness. We were created in the image of God. We talked about that a little bit this morning in Men's Sunday School. Self-image. We were created in the image of God. And I have to tell you, I'm so glad that image is not physical image because I can't imagine God looking like me. You know, we'll look at a kid and say, he looks like his father, poor kid. <laughs> I can't imagine God looking like me. But that image is a spiritual image. We were created in God's image to be full of his love and his care, of his perfection morally. Now, I, I look at something here in the Bible. Over in uh, Leviticus 11.44, it says, You shall be holy, for I am holy. That's repeated in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1. Be holy, because I am holy. I want you to notice something there. It's I am holy not as I am holy. Because you see, if God said, be holy the same way I am holy, there is no chance we would ever make that. Because back to what I said earlier, His holiness is way up here. Our holiness is way down here. And so while He made us in moral perfection, we are to be holy because His Spirit of holiness comes in us and begins perfecting us in our humanity. And we become more and more like Him, but we cannot become as He is because His holiness is so far above us. Back to that Holy of Holies. A mere mortal could not walk into the Holy of Holies and see God face to face and live. It was impossible. Holiness is the outcome of God's work in us. The 51% principle that soon becomes 75% 
that soon becomes 90%, that soon becomes 99 and 98%, then becomes 100% God living in us. Ephesians 5.27 says that Jesus came to present us, the church, to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish. I have a bad habit. When I eat, I, I've got this little shelf down here when I sit down. And, and I've noticed that sometimes when I eat, and even sometimes when I'm brushing my teeth on Sunday morning, it, it gets something on it. And so I've made the habit of, I don't put my dress shirt on on Sunday until after I've brushed my teeth. Just that simple. Because I know how many times I've gotten to church and I've looked down and I thought, oh, there's a spot on this shirt. Someone's going to see it and think I'm a bum. I went out a couple of weeks ago and bought a couple of new shirts because some of the dress shirts I was wearing had spots and stains on them. I, I make sure I iron my shirt every Saturday and hang it neatly back up with nothing by it so it's not wrinkled on Sunday because if I don't, Marcy gets upset at me. What does the Bible say? Jesus presents us to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish. That's what he does to us. He irons us. He, he makes sure the stains are gone. He, he makes sure the blemishes are gone so that we can be presented to God the Father through the power of the Holy Spirit is holy before without holiness. No man or woman shall see the Lord. I, I've come to the place where I know that the only way we can live a holy lifestyle is through the power of God living within us through that spirit of holiness, through that spirit of power, through the freedom that he gives us. And it's a glorious freedom. Join us this morning as we sing that song.